All right, yeah, he's back in. All right. All right, third time's a charm, I let's think. Do, let's give it a shot. Let's give it a go. go for two, but sometimes he's a, company. he's a pitcher. That's what he likes. Didn't I like to, be O2. Hey! I like to be O2. We got it. Let's go. Ben, I, I appreciate Always. your patience. Yeah, man. Look, I'm just glad I'm figuring some of this stuff. I'm not real good with this technology stuff, so I'm kind of I'm kind of proud. I'm normally my wife is here or my son's here to help me out, but I'm doing this all <laughs> by myself, so it's a good night. I love it's it. It's a good night. I love it. Listen, I know you're probably up in the woods somewhere, and so you know it's you just gotta you gotta figure out you know how to how to navigate with the uh, with nature. So you're oh, I'm glad you're here with us. That's right. Yeah. All right. So that's we're, right. Yeah. We're talking about Brody, and I know you had already answered this question a little bit, but it kind of broke up. But when you face a guy like that who's got that much, that, that kind of stuff, and, you know, is able to walk eight guys, but also, you know, get out of those jams. Like, how hard is that? One, offensively, is very hard to hit, but how do you repeat your delivery? How do you get more consistent with that type of stuff? Or is that something that, you know, experience is going to help? Because I know he's a two-sport two guy. You're a two-sport guy. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I mean, it, to me, it's I'm a little bit surprised for one thing. He's such a good athlete you would think that he could figure out a way to repeat his his delivery a little bit more than what he does, right? So that's a little bit of a surprise. Now, having said that, the kid only threw 25 innings as a freshman last year. He went to summer ball this past summer, and his very first start, his elbow got sore, and he got shut down for the rest of the summer. Then he comes back, and he goes to football. And so if you think about it, the kid's only got 28 college innings under his belt right now. Uh, he's very new to this pitching thing. He pitched a little bit in high school. But, you know, kids from Iowa, their, their high school programs is played in the middle of the summer. They don't have a bunch of travel ball and all those kind of things. So he's very new to pitching in a lot of ways. I think he figures it out. I think it's just going to take some mound time, some experience to figure it out. Now, last year he walked more than he had innings pitched. So I think he had 25 innings of pitching last year. He walked 27 or 28. That was a concern of mine. But in his first start this year, he was perfect. Like he went five innings, faced 15 batters, 15 up, 15 down. So maybe I thought he had turned a corner. Maybe they thought he did too. But it wasn't quite the same against LSU. But one thing you can't deny is the arm strength. He's got something obviously you cannot teach. You can't teach 101. Uh, and so he's a good enough athlete. I think he figures it out. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Do you see Iowa maybe, uh, you know, making some noise in the Big Ten. I talked to Jay a little bit before earlier today, and he said that Iowa's got, you know, a chance to win the Big Ten with some of the arms they got and the guys they got in the lineup. Yeah, I think so. I, I like their lineup. They got a couple guys in that lineup that are very physical. Uh, obviously, Maryland was the class of the Big Ten last year. Rutgers is supposed to be up there. But D1 baseball has uh, Maryland, Iowa, and Rutgers as, as NCAA tournament team. So I think they're a tournament team. I think they got a shot to win the Big Ten. I think a lot's going to ride on Brody Breck, right? Can he be a, a Saturday night guy for him? Can he be in that weekend rotation to give him a chance to win every time out? If he figures it out and throws strikes, I think they're definitely a regional team. I think they can win the Big Ten. Speaking of rotation, outside of Riley Cooper, Paul Skeens, tough first, which this is, you know it as a starting pitcher. 34 pitches in the first inning, didn't really feel as sharp as he has been the first outing, and then all of a sudden, he goes six innings, strikes out 11, and got put that first inning behind him. How hard is that to do one, and what did you see from him facing his first little bit of adversity this year early in the season? Yeah, not uncommon. I mean, you guys know this. But I mean, it used to be and still is. If you're going to get a starting pitcher a lot of times, if you're going to get a horse, you better get him in the first inning because once he gets his rhythm going, I always felt like the first inning was the toughest one for me just because I learned it took me a while, but – what you had that bullpen warming up did not always translate to the game mound. And I, I left that bullpen mound sometimes before games going, they in trouble tonight. Like, I got my <laughs> A game tonight, and I'm in the shower in the third inning, you know. And then I left that bullpen before going, man, y'all heat the shower up because it's going to be a short night for me. And you turn around in the eighth inning and you're still pitching. And so it's just a warm-up down there. But the first innings are always very difficult, trying to get your rhythm, trying to get the umpire strike zone. You're facing the best hitters on the other team right out of the chute. And so you're trying to figure some things out. It was good to see Paul struggle a little bit in the first inning. He wasn't quite as sharp. His, his command wasn't quite as good. But, man, after the first inning, he figured it out, and it was Friday night, lights yeah. out after that. I mean, he got after it after that. So that's what a real ace does. You make If you're going to get him, you better get him early. Offensively, LSU, is no, you know, their lineup is, has had a lot of hype behind it. It has a lot of publicity going into the season. You know what you're going to get with Dylan Cruz. Tommy White's just now kind of trying to get comfortable after the shoulder deal. 
Uh, they had Trey Morgan in left field. You had Jared Jones at first base. A lot of these guys have had some moments. On Saturday, they didn't put it together, but on Sunday, they responded in a big way. What did you see from the offense, and what did you like to see after, uh, from that rebound they had from Saturday to Sunday? Yeah, I mean, look, we've not seen this LSU team at its best yet. I mean, Tommy Tanks gets hurt after one at bat on last Friday night, and he doesn't play again, you know, until now he's DH. So we hadn't seen this team the way we want to see it yet. We know Trey Morgan ran in the wall out left field. He had to miss a game. And so uh, it, they've been out of sorts in some ways. I just thought they were out of sorts on Saturday for whatever reason. They swung it pretty good on Friday night, but I don't know. I think they got flustered a little bit. It was good to see them struggle in some ways. You never like to see a team lose, but it was a wake-up call in some ways is that we're pretty good. But, look, when you're number one, and you guys know this, when you're number one team in the country, you got a big bullseye oh, yeah. on your chest every time you go out there. You're going to get everybody's A game every time you go out there. So you got to answer the bell. It was good to see them bounce back like they did yesterday. Dylan Cruz proved yesterday, uh, and really all yeah. year long so far, why he is arguably the best player in the country, could very well be the number one pick in the country. Wyatt Lankford over at Florida may have something to say about that. Chase Dolander over at Tennessee could have something to say about that. But Dylan Cruz is a star. I mean, he's a star. Uh, he swings it well. I mean, you guys probably saw it yesterday, but yeah. he was five for five and then went five for six. And I'm not talking about cheapies. Yeah. I mean, he hit two balls. I don't know I don't know what the, the velo off the bat was, the exit velocity, but it was 110 or above on two or three of them, just line drives off the wall. So it's special when you see Dylan Good to see Joe Bear. You know, 25 pounds he's lost. He's in much better shape this year. He said his bat feels quicker. His body feels better. He got really serious about what he was doing. This is his draft year. Uh, and so he wants to make some noise. He had some big noise yesterday, uh, too. Jared Jones continues to impress me like he does, y'all. Look, they list that kid at 6'4". It ain't 6'4". Like, I'm telling you, I, I'm looking him yeah. eye to eye. Uh -huh. Like, it's like it, – it's six five six six all day long. It's two fifty. Uh, it's it's a quicker bat than what I expected to see, and it kind of reminds me of you guys. Uh, it's a physical team, right? Yeah. Like like I, I love I love Paul to death, and I've said this on the air a hundred times. But I felt like there for a while, Paul was telling the recruit coordinators, "Listen, don't recruit anybody bigger than me. You know, it's got to be <laughs> five foot five." Or like that. And so. This is this is like the most physical LSU team I've seen in a long time. Like there's some real dudes out there that can bang it around. And so that Fry kid is really big. I mean, Jared Jones is impressive at the plate. Tommy Tanks looks like a beer league softball dude. Like he can swing it, you know. Now, now he he's 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 scuffling a little bit, right? He's missed some time. You can tell he's jumping at the ball. He's pressing, and you know he's he had 27 homers. Everybody's talking about him a lot, so he's wanting to get out of the gate quick yeah. like he did last year. He just needs to slow it down a little bit. The good news, and you guys know all about this, when you got protection in the lineup, and all these guys are protected this year between you know between Dugas at the top and, and of course Trey Morgan and Dylan Cruz and Tommy Tanks and Jerry Jones. It, you can't just key on one person. So right. they got protection in this lineup. They're gonna see some pitches. So, Ben, it, it, you bring up the, the protection that they have in the lineup and how deep the lineup is. I think the one thing that, for me, that stuck out the opening weekend was how well they were able to string together at bat after at bat of just being a tough out. Now, obviously, they had the, the bump in the road. They didn't play very well against a very good arm on Saturday. Did you see any of the same traits throughout the weekend about how well they were actually able to just grind out at bats over and over again and almost seemingly kind of – tire out the other team's pitching staff until they got what they wanted at the plate. I, I can't really hear Jerry, but I, I heard bits and pieces about what he was saying. But I, I think I got what he said, um, you know, about grinding out at bats. I mean, I think LSU's done a pretty good job of that this year. Uh, I think it, their swing decisions have to get better. Uh, as we know, when you get to conference play, uh, it ramps up about two notches on the pitchers. The pitchers yeah. get much better. I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, LSU strike, strike it out a good bit so far this year. That concerns me a little bit because, you know, when Chase Dolander comes to town and Beam and Burns with Tennessee and Texas A&M dudes, uh, it gets very difficult on the weekends in the SEC. That is a concern of mine. What is also a concern of mine is can you generate runs when you're not banging it, right? LSU not stealing a lot of bases this year. Didn't steal many bases last year. Dead last in the league in stolen bases last year. We only got two bags this year. You know, when that offense is off a little bit, can you manufacture a run, right? Can you steal a base when you need to to get in scoring position? That's a concern for me to play a little bit of small ball from time to time. 
Uh, LSU is going to bank it. There's no doubt they're going to bank it. And when they're on like they were yesterday, they're the best team in the country. When you run up against Chase, Chase Dolander, how do you scratch out two or three runs? How do you beat a guy like that? So right. I'm a little bit concerned about that. But I think this team's going to continue to get better. Obviously, Dylan Cruz has got to be really good. Jordan Thompson at the bottom has got to be really good. The Polts got to be good. So it's going to have to be top to bottom for LSU to get back to Omaha. There's no doubt about it. But listen, guys, compared to where they've been the last yeah. two or three years with, with options yeah. both on the mound yeah. and options on the bench, I love where LSU is right now because it's a very talented team. We all know it's got to come together, right? I mean, Tennessee team yeah. last year was probably the best team I'd ever seen commentating baseball like it was the can't miss going to win the national championship they don't make it out of their super regional Ole Miss was the very last team to get in yeah. the NCAA tournament last year as a lot of people jump up down and go Ole Miss shouldn't be in there's no way they, they suck they shouldn't be in the NCAA tournament <laughs> well they go win the national championship last year so right. baseball is a different kind of game and you guys know that yeah absolutely now I want to I want to stay on LSU for a little bit before we go to the SEC because we know how deep the SEC is and obviously they had some some big-time performances, and I want to get your opinion on it. LSU plays tomorrow. They play Texas tomorrow in Austin. What do you want to see from them tomorrow before they start going to Because the SEC season is starting to get closer and closer, and you would like for them before that opening series at A&M, you want them to feel like they're kind of hitting on all cylinders and they've kind of gotten comfortable at the plate. What do you want to see from the team tomorrow at, in Texas? Their first real, like, competition, top-to-bottom team that can really compete with them with, with the talent. Yeah, this is not a neutral site like it was, right. you know, this, at, at the Round Rock this week. And you go into uh, Austin there and you play at Dish Falk Field. That's a tough place to win. It'll be a nice crowd there, obviously, tomorrow night. Texas is not quite the same, the team they have been the last two or three years, but they still have some big-time pieces, and they're going to get better. Uh, I, I think the biggest thing for me, Thatcher Hurd, right? I, I think it's a huge outing for him. He didn't look great against Southern last Tuesday. I think he's supposed to start tomorrow, what I, what I heard through the grapevine. And so I'm looking at him to see if he commands the strike zone. Big time stuff. I mean, we saw him up to 97 against Southern, but he kind of sprayed it. He had too many walks. The ball was all over the place. He's got to lock it in and get going too, you know. And so I want to see how LSU responds in this type of environment. I'm sure Texas is going to throw, you know, one of their real dudes at LSU. And and we'll see how LSU can respond to that. I think they got a lot of confidence on what they did yesterday at the plate. But I think the the, the good thing about it is Thatcher Hurd's got to go out there and pitch well. The other thing is Christian Little, who's been outstanding for me, he didn't even he didn't even throw this weekend. Right. So you got him backing up Thatcher Hurd. So uh, again, we got options this year that we hadn't had in the past. Christian Little's been outstanding so far, and so I think LSU's got plenty of arms left uh, in, in the tank for Texas. But I, I, I'm really focused on Thatcher Hurd and his command of the strike zone. So LSU is obviously the consensus number one team in the country. Even after a slip up to Iowa, they're still number one team. But the SEC as a whole is super deep, right? Obviously, being number one doesn't really mean anything now. It only matters at the end of the season in Omaha. But you have Tennessee, you have Mississippi State, you have Vanderbilt, you have Ole Miss. I can go down a list on all these teams that are very hyped up. Going through the weekend, going through the SEC, Tennessee started the season with a, you know, they lost a series of opening season. They come back, they sweep Dayton this weekend. What have you seen throughout the SEC on some teams and what teams have surprised you and what teams have kind of disappointed you already first two weekends of the season? Well, the, I mean, look, the surprise team, uh, Alabama, I know they were ranked early, but they backed it up. They're 8-0. Uh, Brad Bohannon's got them playing some ball. They're the only team in the West that's undefeated right now. South Carolina, uh, I tell you what, go look at their home runs. I don't know how they're doing it, but they played like seven or eight games. They got 26 bombs, guys. It's like, wow, what's going on over there, you know? And they're eight, no, they're the only undefeated team in the East. So those are kind of the surprise teams for me. I was a little bit surprised Tennessee dropped two or three opening weekend. Uh, Ole Miss seems to be a team again. They 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 played uh, hosted Maryland, who is a ranked team, won the Big Ten, hosted a regional last year. They got some dudes on their team and Ole Miss dropped Friday night, but then won Saturday and Sunday uh, uh, against Maryland. Um, I tell you, Florida, look out for Florida. Caglione, y'all might have saw Jack Caglione. I was about uh, to ask. I was about to ask sick. you. I was about to ask you about him. Yeah, that's scary. You know, he can get on the mound and throw a hundred, <laughs> and he had six homers last week. You know, and so yeah, he's a real dude too. 
Uh, as you know, Florida got nicked up last year. They lost some, some two of their two of their three weekend rotation guys. Uh, they're getting their guys back healthy again. It's a big time offense. Uh, Waltrip transferred from Southern Miss. Southern Miss is aces over there for their he'd be their Friday night guy now. They they got a real team uh, at Florida, so I expect Florida to be there when the, when the dust settles. Vanderbilt's going to have a better team than what they had last year, no doubt in my mind. Uh, there's enough there with Vandy. Enrique Bradfield is a special, special player, and they got a little bit of uh, depth there, and so they're going to be solid. Arkansas will be, yeah. you know, a top five, top ten team. I mean, look, look who LSU. LSU starts off with A and M, top ten team. Then they get Arkansas. Then they get Tennessee. That's your first three games in conference, or first three series, I should say. Mm-hmm. So there are no breaks like it used to be years and years ago. Everybody can play now, and so. But, but look, I've always said it's a good thing. Yes, it is a mental and physical grind in the SEC, that 30-game grind. But it only prepares you for the postseason because you know as a player and you know as a coach, you're not going to see anything in postseason that you hadn't seen in that 30-game schedule in the SEC. So at the end of the day, while it's difficult to navigate through it, it does make you feel good knowing that going into postseason play. Ben, I, I appreciate your time and your insight. One more question before I let you go, right? You talk about the SEC. Everybody talks about SEC football and how good and how deep SEC football is. I think baseball, top to bottom, that's their best sport as far as, like, you know, how deep is the league, right? Uh, the top teams are really good, but yeah. the bottom teams are almost as good as the top teams. The, the margin of, of the gap <laughs> between them is not, not by a lot. You came in the SEC and you were at LSU in 1989. You kind of were on the, the up the, – the come up of LSU and really SEC baseball. What is it like now to sit back and commentate and see it at from as a fan's perspective on how much baseball, college baseball in particular, has grown and how good the SEC has become? Yeah, you know, I sit up there in some ballparks and just I'm just an amazement of the ballparks, yeah. right? How how much? I mean, the facilities now are, are are like big league facilities now. You walk around LSU, Ole Miss, you go to Mississippi State. I mean, Vanderbilt's big upgrades all around. Alabama's got a new ballpark. It's crazy, the facility upgrades. That's what the amazing thing is to me. And I was kind of at the very beginning of the SEC beginning to grow. And, you know, if we had four or 5,000 fans, it was a big night. I mean, now it's almost like every ballpark you go to, there's four or 5,000 people there, you know. And, of course, at LSU and Ole Miss and Mississippi State, there's a lot more than that. So that's amazement to me is that uh, the facility upgrade – uh, that's out there. I mean, we're pulling big league pitching coaches now to back to college baseball. What does that tell you about the SEC? Right. I mean, Wes Johnson was not only in the big leagues with Minnesota, he was coaching a first place team in July in the big leagues, and yet he comes to LSU in the middle of the season. So that kind of tells you where the SEC is right now. And I'll tell you one more thing. In the preseason, there's so many polls out there but 11 of the 14 SEC teams were ranked in some poll during the preseason. That's how stout the SEC is from top to bottom. And there are no more weekends off. You know, Missouri can even beat you. I mean, Missouri's got some some, some dudes, too. They can beat you if you don't show up on any given uh, weekend. So it's a tough conference. It's the best conference in baseball. It's the best conference in football. Uh, and as they say, it just means more. It just means more. Coach, think about the SEC for just for a second. Whenever you look at what happened with Tennessee over the weekend, does that mean anything to you? What, where L, Not even LSU, but where the SEC is going with the transfer portal where you see them add a guy back and you see Vitello get suspended for a weekend and then they bring both of the guys back. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts were on kind of how the transfer portal is working and how this is going to all play out going into the future. Yeah, uh, uh, Ma- Maui Ahuna, I think is the yep. kid's name. He was like the number one. Him and Tommy Tanks were both the number one transfer portal guys out there. Ahuna comes from Kansas, I believe it was, shortstop. Yep. Everybody warned him. And I just read a little bit about, you know, maybe the recruiting process happened maybe a little bit sh- sooner than what it should have. <laughs> uh, for, but I feel like that's where we are. You yeah. know, I, it's, it's like I, I watch these coaches in basketball shake hands with the opposing team after the game. And it's almost like they're going down the line going, hey, nice job. Uh, you look good as a purple and gold next year. <laughs> nice job. You look good as a purple and gold next year. Uh, like, 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 and I, I'm not saying Kim Mulkey's doing that because I love her death, but almost like she shakes her hand and she grabs her hand and goes, boy, you're a, you're a hell of a player. And you're going to look good <laughs> purple and gold next like year. You know? And so, yeah. So that, that's what it almost seems like to me sometimes. So, you know, look, it's, it's hard for me. I don't totally agree with it. Uh, I get it. It's where we are in college game now. But, man, I just feel for the coaches because the coaches are having to recruit 
their next incoming classes, but they're also trying to continue to recruit the kids they have on their roster because they just know that I got to keep these kids. And if I don't, they're going to take their ball and go somewhere else. And so it's a difficult time to be a coach right now. It's hard to build teams right now and to be able to count on a guy like I knew when Mikey Matuk came to LSU, he was going to be there three years, right? Mitchell's going to be there three right. years. I, I can, I can plan on that, but I can't plan anymore because these kids now, man, and I, I really feel for the mid majors because yeah. if some of these kids blow up yeah. in the mid majors, man, they coming to get you like that. The big boys are coming yeah. to get you. And so it's very difficult for those coaches to be able to recruit and coach, but it's where we are, man, like it or not, it's where we are. It's, it's kind of the haves and have nots right now, you know? Uh, circling back to, to LSU and what you saw over the weekend and obviously through the first two weeks of the season, if you had to pinpoint for you one thing that you feel is the biggest question for them moving forward, what would you say that is? I tell you what, I, uh, we hadn't talked about it yet. Nobody's talking about it. Defense. Last year, LSU fielded 963. They were the worst team in the SEC. And I don't mind right. saying it, it was the worst LSU defense I have ever seen in 30-something years. That's how bad the defense yeah. was for LSU last year, especially in the middle infield. LSU's only made two errors this year. I'm watching that really close. They're second in the SEC right now in fielding percentage, fielding 991. So that's a big part for me. I think LSU's going to hit. I think LSU's going to pitch. The question is, can they make the routine plays and not give away games like they did five or six times last year? So right. I would circle defense, being able to make those routine plays. Gavin Dugas, uh, I I've been watching, right? I mean, ever right. since I remember him as right. freshman year, he's played left field. Then when I heard he was going to play second base right. this year, I went, oh, no. You know, it's yeah. like, Wait, huh? what are we doing? <laughs> but he had a couple really nice plays on the backhand side yeah. yesterday. He looked really good. Uh, Dylan Cruz is an elite center field defender out there. Uh, some other guys look good. Uh, tip of the cap to Jordan Thompson. I've been tough yeah. on Jordan the last couple of years because, look, he was my man was tackling some balls at shortstop last year. Yeah. Like it was like, I yeah, I didn't want to like I'm just gonna knock it down and throw you out because I don't know if I can catch it. Right? Well, <laughs> he looks different. He looks different to me this year. Like he's got his chest stuck out a little bit yeah. now. He's got a little bounce in his step. Like he looks like a dude that's confident right now. I'm happy for him. He's worked so hard. And Jay loves him. Jay said, look, Jay's on record saying yeah. I think he's going to be one of the better defending shortstops, not only in the SEC, but in the entire country. And he's been that good so far for LSU. So that's the big thing I'm watching from the Tigers is can they defend at a high level? Yeah, and I, we, look, yeah. Jor Jordan came on the show uh, last week, I think, or maybe two weeks ago. And, and you know, he kind of won me over. He won us over based off what he said. Same things as you said. He's worked really hard to put himself in this position. And adversity kind of helps – motivate you to, to outperform what people think. And so I think he's going to got a chip on his shoulder, which is good. Now she's going to find out real soon. Tomorrow they're going to face the best competition they've faced all year. And defense is going to be as important as ever as, as, as tomorrow night because you can't give them extra bases. Ben, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you sticking with us through the connect, co connectivity issues. And I can't wait to talk, <laughs> can't wait to talk with you more throughout the season with, uh, as the Tigers move along. Yeah, man. I always enjoy hanging with you guys. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Anytime. Thank you, man. All right. Take care.